<clears throat> so if you have an atom, and guys, y'all have probably all seen this representation. That's really scratchy, but you know, for what an atom looks like, that you've got a nucleus <clears throat> and you've got electrons orbiting the nucleus. And how we still envision it, and you guys still probably, me sometimes, is like the planets orbit the sun. That's not how electrons orbit the nucleus, okay? That's just how um, our simple minds imagine it. <clears throat> we imagine that electrons are then in these orbits and that they just spin around a nucleus. Y'all have heard of different valence shells? Yeah, so there's different, some are close to the nucleus, like this first one, and they get further and further and further. Well, um, if an electron, say, we're going to stick with this, it's simple, yes, it's not the way it is, but it's a good way to explain it by looking at this. If you've got an electron right here in that first orbit, <clears throat> if that atom gets excited, and atoms can get excited, it absorbs energy. Well, there's a certain amount of energy required to keep that electron right there in that first orbit. When it absorbs energy, that electron absorbs the energy and it can't stay there. The electron jumps to a higher orbit when it absorbs energy. Well, it doesn't want to hang on to that energy. It wants to get rid of it. So when that electron releases energy and it releases that energy in the form of light, it releases the energy and it goes back to where it originally was, to where it normally is. <clears throat> different atoms would have different numbers of orbits around them, right? And electrons located in different places. And so when they, like when this next one I drew, when it absorbs energy, these electrons are going to move maybe from this first one to the second one, or maybe from the first one way out here to the fifth one. Yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> Depending on where they jump and where they've got to fall back down to, it's going to release different wavelengths of light. That's why you're going to have different colors, whether it's from heat, or different colors, whether it's from different types of light sources, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me. The spectroscopes that you have, when y'all look through those and you look at the light in this room, I told you that it takes that light and it breaks it down to its different wavelengths. If we were to take those spectroscopes outside, and of course outside is lit by sunlight, not a whole lot today because it's overcast, but if we were to go out this door and look at those spectroscopes um, outside and look at the sunlight, we wouldn't see the lines. When y'all look through them, do you see the lines in here that I'm talking about? If you took them outside and looked at them, you would see a rainbow because the sun emits light of all wavelengths. It's not just certain ones. It's every wavelength, so we would see a pretty little Roy G. Biv. All the colors blended together. <clears throat> I've got a light up here, and I'm going to show you different lamps. And those are the different lights. When y'all look at the hydrogen lamp through your spectroscope, you should see four lines. And I know those are not the most expensive spectroscopes, okay? But do y'all, can y'all, especially up front, Will and Jeremy and De DeAndre, can y'all see the four distinct lines for hydrogen? Turn it, uh, look through it, and go this way. Let's see if you can. But if you look in your book at page 221, there's a diagram of what y'all are doing right here, okay? The diagram on page 221 shows a hydrogen lamp, and it shows that light passing through a prism, like we talked about at the beginning of class. That prism is like your spectroscope. It breaks the light from hydrogen right here down into its different wavelengths, and it produces those four lines. And so that would be the fingerprint for hydrogen. Every element has its own line spectrum. That's its fingerprint. Have you ever wondered... You know, when you're reading something about the solar system, and we'll talk about different planets, and scientists can tell you, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to have to make something up because I don't know. Uh, like the atmosphere of Jupiter is mainly helium, right? So lot, Jupiter could not support life as we know it because it's not oxygen. 
how do they know? I made all that up. I don't know if it's accurate or not. But y'all have heard things like that about the different planets. How do they know Jupiter's helium? Nobody's ever been to Jupiter. They look at line spectrums of light from the planets. How do they know, oh, the stars are actually this gas that's burning? How do they know that? They look at the light from the stars and they compare it to line spectrums that we know because we've got the elements here on the Earth, right? We can look at their line spectrums. They compare it to standards and then they're able to say, oh, well, it's made up of this element and this element and this element. That's kind of cool, right? Scientists wanted to explain that picture you're looking at at 221. Could we calculate, could we predict where the lines for hydrogen would show up on its line spectrum? So Niels Bohr, have you guys ever heard of Bohr? The, whole, the model of the atom, this little model, that is the Bohr model of the atom. Uh, Niels Bohr decided, I'm going to study hydrogen. I'm going to see if I can come up with mathematical formulas that would predict where those four lines for hydrogen will show up, like you see on page 221. Why would Bohr study hydrogen? Okay, good guess. It's, we have enough of it, but it's not because it, it would be abundant. Why would hydrogen... So I want to electron. Hydrogen would be simple to study, exactly, because as Will said, it only has one electron. So, wouldn't, I mean, you can calculate the formulas for that single electron. You don't have to worry about others interfering, like we kind of saw in that video. So that's why Bohr picked hydrogen. It only has one electron. And if you look down the page on 221 in that little yellow box, there's a formula. Bohr came up with a mathematical formula that would calculate where the lines for hydrogen would show up. So he was able to determine that. He was also able to relate the energy back to the wavelength of the different lights, etc. Don't worry, we're not going to do any of those calculations. I just want you to know that Bohr was able to come up with a mathematical explanation for hydrogen. The problem was, when they moved to other elements, any other element, Bohr's formulas didn't hold up. Why? Because the other elements, well, it, they have more electrons. And the electrons start interfering with other, and as that video said, the wave functions collapse. It didn't hold true for other elements. So that opened this whole world of quantum mechanics. Bohr's formulas only held up for hydrogen, not for other elements. So that brings us to this quantum mechanics, your handout that I just gave you. Um, when we watched that video, y'all saw that electrons behaved as waves, but we know electrons are particles, right? they're matter. And in that third paragraph on your handout, it talks about Louis de Broglie. He proposed that theory that electrons are both, wave-particle duality. That was actually de Broglie's theory that he came up with. So, how can you determine the position of a wave? If waves are constantly moving, how do you know exactly where it is? Well, Heisenberg came up with his principle. It's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. That's the next paragraph that says it's impossible to know with certainty both where an electron is and where it's going. Because it, if it's a wave and it's constantly moving, then you know where it, maybe where it has been, but you don't know where it is now. Is that what we have with the starting point? That's, well, that's kind of why we have to keep diagrams like this, okay? That's why it fit for hydrogen, but it didn't fit for other ones, because you can't know both of them. But that brings us to the Schrodinger equation, and that's kind of what we're going to be looking at next on this sheet. Um, the Schrodinger equation took into account that electrons are both waves and particles. And Schrodinger said, okay, you're right, we can't know exactly where an electron is or where it's going, but we can calculate a probability of where we're most likely to find the electron. Isn't that nice, just probabilities? For example, guys, if we had a Coke bottle in, in here and we put a fly in the Coke bottle and we sat the Coke bottle 
on the table in the middle of this room, and we all left. Okay? Now, I'm gonna, we're going to go outside the room, and we know that the lab is laid out like so, right? And there's three tables in the middle of the lab. And I asked you guys, now tell me, think back to the room and where we left the coat bottle, where are you most likely to find that fly in the room? Well, could the fly, if we sat the coat bottle right here, is there a probability, a plausible probability, that the fly would be over here? No, where'd we leave the fly? In the coat bottle. So where are we most likely to find the fly? We're most likely to find the fly right there, aren't we? That fly is the electron. And so that's what we're looking at. Where are you most likely to find the electron? Well, you know where it's most likely to be. You know where it's probably not going to be. And so quantum mechanics said we can tell where it should be, an area of where it should be. Now, so in that little circle in the middle, because we're looking at it from uh, the air, right? We know the fly is in that area, but that's a three-dimensional area, right? I'm just drawing it on a two-dimensional board. Do you know the path that fly is flying? Mm -mm. You don't know if he's jumping up and down in that Coke bottle or if he's just flying around in a circle or maybe he's just sitting still. So you don't know how that electron's moving around. You just know where you're most likely to find it. And that's what quantum mechanics is.